Hello, Internet. It is me, Tim TK, with a Silver Line show on Tuesday. Uh, right now, Mr. Quentin Bedwell will be joining us shortly. Right now, he's eating coffee. Uh, currently, uh, our other co hosts, which would be uh, Jose Fuentes and uh, Mickens Wortman, are either without power or without internet due to the uh, hurricane in the southeast. So, uh, wishing them the best, and hopefully, they'll be able to join us next week. Uh, this week, however, we'll be talking about uh, why you should write comics. We're going to be talking about the benefits of comics as opposed to other mediums. And we'll be, uh, this will be kind of a short one uh, due to uh, some of the engagements that uh, we have tomorrow as well as the uh, lack of, of a host present. So uh, talking about why you want to write comics as opposed to medium, other mediums, uh, a little bit of context. Obviously, I write comics. I've written uh, Wolf Hunter and a few other pitches out there. I have some scripts waiting for uh, uh, one one radiant on the artist to get back to me, and the other ones, you know, waiting on people to accept them. Uh, but in addition to that, I have written and published several pieces of short fiction, um, short screenplays, uh, things like that. So uh, I have experience working in other mediums as well as comics. So uh, should be able to. Give you give you an idea of what the pros and cons are between the different medium options you have as a writer. Uh, when Quinn gets here, uh, wants to get his input, being someone who is you know crafted a tabletop game, and compare that to comics as well. Uh, so, pretty pretty loose notes today as far as uh, getting through the meat of the subject. But uh, having written, yeah. Uh, uh, short fiction, uh, the, you know, there are certain benefits to writing in traditional prose uh, that you don't necessarily, you know, have, have the, the opposite, have a, it comes a problem when you're working in comics, and that being that you know, when you're working with prose, it's all you. Uh, you don't need to worry about, you know, hiring an artist or having a publisher hire an artist, working with an editor, um, outside of, you know, the editor of the publication. Uh, if you're doing a self-published comic, which is becoming more of the norm, uh, you may need to hire out a project editor, uh, which isn't the worst idea for a Trish. But uh, it is by no means necessary because you're, you're not communicating with other you know, party members on down the line. Um, and so... Uh, this is a, a pro and a con... And Mr. Quentin is back. Yes. So we're talking about uh, is this game become my history of writing for different mediums and talking about the the pros and cons coming from short fiction over to comics and why you know what what pros may make you want to write in comics as opposed to other mediums that are are available to you as a writer. Uh, and first, first thing I had to cover is, you know, in traditional pub, uh, publishing or traditional prose as a writer, you're working by yourself. You, you're not working with a team, uh, which can be a pro because you don't need to worry about hiring out artists or working on other people's deadlines. It's kind of you, you get it done when you get it done. Um, you don't uh, have to worry about pushing out anything anyone else. Um, uh, the the flip side to this is you're you're because you're not working anyone else. Um, you're not getting a mix of inputs that can really um, elevate the storytelling, um, or you know, the nice thing about working with artists is it's almost like working with another layer of, of edits, and that they have their own vision and ideas of how it should look. Uh, so when you get your script out, you have your own mental image, and when you're writing your book, uh, if you're working in traditional prose, you have your own mental image out. Uh, and the audience probably isn't going to get that same mental image. You, you hope you get close to it, but everyone's going to picture it differently. With an artist, you actually get to see that image come to life and actually get to see how your what your words are really saying, or at least how they're interpreted. And an artist can, they, you know, in their own interpretation, can also add to the storytelling in a way that you wouldn't be able to if you're working just by yourself. Um, and uh, if you're a deadline-driven person working with an artist or working with other team members on a comic, um, 
I can't perhaps force you to stop procrastinating, which is something that I feel like all writers are guilty of. Uh, yes. Yeah, but knowing that uh, Quentin is waiting with a pencil in hand for you to get the script to him, uh, I can I can force you to actually get the script done. <clears throat> yeah, that's what I do. Yes. I'm just gnawing at the bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. Uh, no, I haven't had that issue yet. Usually the stuff's already pretty much done by the time I get it, so... Nice. Good. Yeah, people are just waiting on me now. So, <laughs> well, I imagine you're also you have quite a few projects, so you're probably always working. Yeah, on something, I do, so. and got yeah. a lot of a lot of stuff that uh, is just on the back burner. Mm -hmm. So, got to do what you got to do. You got to prioritize. Can't let the grass grow under your feet. That's for sure. Exactly. Uh, and uh, you know another benefit of writing comics that you don't have in uh, traditional prose that kind of loses this part of this is being able to turn it into a visual experience. Um, already kind of seeing a shift in that more people watch movies than read books. Uh, more people watch videos than read blogs in terms of just the type of content they yeah. consume. But uh, comics is just in a weird place in that they can be both visual and written. Um, and uh, there does add um, a level of uh, cinema, additional level of like engagement to it. it. Makes if something is both well written and well illustrated, it becomes very compelling. And like you know, that's the reason why you yeah. have things like that, like uh, Watchmen, which is you know held to the same standards as you know would be considered like high literature, essentially. Right. Yeah, it uh, makes a big difference, you know, the, the the team, the chemistry between the team. And, you know, they can be really good friends, but not, you know, and they can understand each other. But, you know, sometimes the, the chemistry, the magic just happens and sometimes it does not. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, with writing and with art, you know, you were just talking about some of the differences, you know. Yeah. Just to highlight some of those, I mean, you know, with with my art, you know, it's pretty much immediate whether it's acceptable or not acceptable. Uh, mm -hmm. The writing, it takes a little more time to bear that out, whether it's working or not working, uh, you know, because you got the reader reading it, you know, and until yeah. you read it with the pictures, you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, it's kind of hard mm -hmm. to know. No. Uh, but you know, the, the art is pretty much immediate. If I have anatomy off or there's something technical that's messed up, you know, people are going to know immediately, Hey, that arm is, you know, he's got six fingers on that hand or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, can anybody really move that way? That's what I hear a lot of, you know, which I think is, you know, no, war it's warranted sometimes i've seen art where it's really really kind of they went tried to go too dynamic and kind of broke people you know right but um uh, you really do have to exaggerate being an artist but um uh, i think it's you know it's really good if you could be an artist and a writer or mm -hmm. have an artistic type of you know background or mentality you know mm -hmm. but i think that kind of comes with you know for some it's they're kind of born with it some they have to kind of acquire it you know yeah. so I mean, yeah mine's definitely learned um it's uh coming from the background in painting i cannot uh illustrate or concept uh worth anything but I understand aesthetics and understand composition. <laughs> so, well, I, uh, I will tell you, Tim, you did really well. Uh, I was really pleased with uh, like the what thing we worked on together, the Wolf Hunter Christmas mm -hmm. special. I was yeah. really, I, I thought that really flowed good. And uh, yeah, I don't know how how you came about it, but it was really, really good. Uh, you you really have an eye for, uh, you know writing and, it, and it, it flowed whenever i read the script i mean it you know it, it really worked um 
and I, I could gain because uh, the the way it goes is you know you get Thank this. You I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Ah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, but you know uh, what I have to do when I read a script is I have to get the pictures. Yeah. Just like when you read a book and you're playing the the scenes out in your head, I have to do that, you know, and I have to pick out which of those scenes I'm going to do for the panels. And, I am you as know, well. yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it really worked well how you wrote it. So you uh, definitely, I think you do have, uh, if you if it's learned, you you've done really well at at learning it. So Thank you. yeah, that's yeah. Well, um and um uh welcome to the show hyper uh, we're talking about why would you why would you as a writer why would you want to write comics as opposed to other mediums and kind of the the visual aesthetic aspect of that and um yeah uh i started painting a bit before i got invited to to submit a script and actually start writing comics so by the time i had started you know put my first script together i had already been painting for a while and i'd kind of and I've always read comics, so I like understand the limitations of the panel. Like you can only do so much, so you end up getting like these really strong static images. And uh, those strong static images is also another, you know, kind of some point for why you'd want to write in comics versus you know writing traditional prose. Um, in traditional prose, it can be really hard to make um, action compelling. Uh, Scott talked about this on the Wednesday Show a while back, but. Uh, you know, when you're writing, you know, fantasy, science fiction, or what have you, and you have sword fights, gunfights, anything like that, if you get too bogged down to the minutia, uh, as a reader, you just kind of your eyes just kind of glaze over because everything is happening, happening, but at the same time, nothing is happening. There's nothing driving this right forward. There's nothing happening on the page that actually requires you to engage with it. Uh, so like R.A. Salvatore, who wrote the Drift books, great writer, but some of those sword fight scenes are just there's so much minutia that gets stuck in it that you just kind of want to like flip through a couple pages to get to the, re the resolution of it. Yeah. But because comics have that visual element of it, you can actually, you know, work with your artist to create compelling action that can go on for several pages. But because it's happening also in a visual space, um, you can have the writing on top of that to engage and push forward the plot uh, in some aspects, whereas the action itself is, can be done in such a way that it pushes for the plot itself. Uh, agreed. Uh, you know, one thing I've noticed about different artists, and I don't know how much of it is the artists and how much of it is the writers, because like the what I'm working on right now, there is fighting scenes, but the script simply just says, and they fight. Perfect. And, you know, <laughs> and then they're fighting again. And some of them are going down. And, you know, so they're not like, taking me panel by panel, you know, you know, mm -hmm. this character hits this character in the mouth and the, uh, you know, a tooth pops out and, you know, uh, not going, you know, play by play. So I have to decide that how I'm going to work that out. Yeah. But what I was getting to is, is if you look at comics and you look at fighting scenes, I think it's interesting how artists do those, how they work those out. Cause some, sometimes the artists to do fight scenes, they'll just have like snapshots of action. Yeah. And then there are some that will go play by play. Like she hops over him, stabs him in the back mm -hmm. as she leaps over. And then next panel, he, uh, you know, does this thing. And then she comes back over, you know, it's, it's like, yeah very stop motion, you know, every move, you know, in the whole ordeal is recorded there in the panels. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, sometimes that's okay. But, you know, uh, sometimes it's just, you know, snapshots. But I, what I find interesting is how some artists kind of usually will stick to one thing or the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, some artists are very snapshotty in their fight scenes, and some some are very, you know, yeah. meticulous. Uh, so, yeah, I think with, the, with that way, I tend to write those scenes. I I like both for different trying to tell different parts of a story. So, 
I like uh, for trying to sell like either power fantasy, like someone just leveled up. You want to have a quick snapshot and that bad guy does something, good guy just trounces them or whatever, or, or mm-hmm. you know, vice versa. Um, but if you're trying to draw out tension and you know, uh, the classic Spider Man is up against the ropes, how is he going to get out of it? You might do the the step by step, you know, just have him get like each panel is just uh, someone going to work on a different limb of him or, or something else. Or, you know, as a reader, expectation of Spider-Man is going to get out of it, but each panel's just him getting, you know, beat back down. Uh, yeah, I think as long as you make each of the moves in the fight scene relevant, mm-hmm. like if you've got a character that's really fast, I mean, you could have them dodging, you know, a few panels of them dodging punches. You know, that'd be right. like snapshots. You don't have to show the other person hitting before right. each one of those. You just show the fist going past the fist going past the leg going around and, you know, the block and, you know, um, so, you know, it's really interesting though. You know, Mm -hmm. everyone is different and, you know, you want to do something a little different every time. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's something I'm really into right now because I am getting into a real fight scene and it's not a gunfight. It's actual physical martial arts type stuff. So, I'm actually having to take my time and I'm having to, okay, where, where do I want to go here? Do I want to go straight from that kick to this hit or, you know, how do I, you know, how fast or slow do I want to make this more snapshotty or. Right. You know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and uh, going back to, you know, uh, why, why you'd want to work in comics and get to those, you know, a uh, snapshot or, or make those action scenes as complete as possible. Uh, we kind of talked about this earlier and, you know, working with the team is that um, I find that, uh, and Quinn, I'll say this, we're like, we know when something doesn't work in comics or a lot quicker than you would in traditional writing. Yeah. Uh, with comics, because you do have that visual element, your editorial process can be very quick because you very quickly, someone's going to spot something, say like, this doesn't work as a visual or this doesn't work, whatever, and you end up changing it or this is within 22 pages. In traditional writing, you you know, unless you have a heart that we're limited by your publisher, um, but a lot of times you're you know writing something on spec and you can just kind of fit it however many words you need. Um, and your editorial process is going to take a long time because you're going to write it and it's it's impossible to to effectively proof or edit your own writing because your brain fills in the gaps when yeah you don't want it to. <laughs> um, That's right. Yeah, because you're. You know the story, or Mm -hmm. kind of. So you know what you were thinking when you wrote this or that. So if you skip something, only somebody else could tell you that. Yeah, exactly. uh, Because they don't know uh, where you're going unless you tell them. Mm -hmm. Um, That's why, you know, if you could write and draw your own stuff, I mean, you you could bypass a lot of the stuff, but at the same time... uh, and that's that'd be a lot on your plate to do too. Yeah, yeah. And that's you know one of those things that like this like you with uh writing comics, uh, you almost get that first layer of editorial quicker than before you actually pass it off to the editor. Is when you pass it off to the artist and they you know see a panel like I don't get the why this is happening here or mm-hmm. this doesn't work. Um, uh, I don't think we really had that on, on Wolf Hunter. You just had we just you had some suggestions on on how to make some visuals more compelling, which was uh, you know one of them being the idea of cocking the gun in the jacket, and you're like, well, we could have the gun half showing out of the jacket first, uh, as he's pointing like out like a, a chest holster to to uh, to sell yeah. what's going to happen later. You on. See, that's that's awesome. That's what's good. Re- that's one of the really good parts of having a collaboration between a writer and an artist. And it not being just one person mm-hmm. is because you can have that kind of collaboration. And if something's not working or if something needs to be changed, you know, you could talk about it and come to a decision. Yeah. Whereas, you know, kind of if you're doing it all by yourself in a dark room, <laughs> mm-hmm. closed off, then you do it how you want to. And then, you know, it's crap and you don't know about it until it's done, you know, right. pretty much. So, Definitely. but yeah. Yeah, that definitely uh, that definitely helps, you know, having uh, some some ability to change or, you know, add or because I, I what I try to do is I try to my best with the art 
to make even the monotonous stuff seem interesting. That's the whole point of dynamic poses. You know, that's why you don't just have characters standing normal and, you know, in yeah. comics and stuff. Because that's, you know, you have to make even the simple things look interesting and eye-catching. Everyone's doing action hands. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, and if you're to look at it, like, we're in traditional publishing and traditional writing, which is, you know, what I've had to experience with, is... Um, if you are getting edits back on something, you know, you might write something for several months, send it off to alpha readers. They'll take a couple months, get notes back to you. You edit that, send it off to your beta readers. They'll yeah. take a couple months, send it back to you, you do edits. And then you send it off to an editor and they'll take a couple months and they send it back to you. And then you edit and then they send it back to them. Man. It, yeah. So you can end up spending like over a year just in edits, sending it to three groups of people. But with comics, if you're working for one of the uh, big companies, you, you probably have like a, as a writer, a week deadline. So you're turning out a script a week. And so you do your script, they send it back to you. You do your edits on the weekend and you send it off and then you get to the artist to do the rest of the month with it. Silverline, so we're a little more loosey goosey with our timelines, but uh, still that similar concept where, uh, you know, you might write, write, I mean, you can also write a script fairly quickly once you get to practice and get your hours in with it. But once you get your, uh, once you get that done, you can probably finish it and, you know, for a short amount of time. Uh, and it doesn't take your artist a, a whole lot of time to get back to you and say, this doesn't work or this needs to be changed or what have you. So uh, with comics, the only thing better than writing something is being done writing something. <laughs> Yes. And yeah. And and in comics, you're going to get that experience a lot quicker because, you know, whereas with traditional publishing, it might take you a full year just to get something like through edits. In comics, you're probably not taking more than a month to get everyone's ed like edit editorial opinion in. And then it's just off to, you know, illustration and inking and all that. Yeah. Uh, I know uh, one of the good things about writing is you're once you're done, you're done. And mm -hmm. you're the, the, the next thing left for you to do is hurry the artist up yeah. or, you know, start, uh, start promotion, start doing something. Yeah. Like start the promoting, start the, you know, Hey, look, we got this coming, uh, you know, all that. But, you know, with the artist, he is like, uh, you know, he's in that thing and it, you know, it's, he's going to yeah. have to go through every word and make a mental picture out of that and set the, you know, well, you know, do what he does. And it, yeah. it just, it takes a little longer, but, uh, yeah. I mean, the weird thing, like with uh, Wolf Hunter number two, uh, I finished the Wolf Hunter volume one. I finished writing and edits, working with Ron as an editor on that, uh, over a year ago, like the entire volume. And, uh, we've just had an issue with, uh, the artist dipping and, uh, without contacting anyone, so now we're hunting for a replacement. But you know, uh, that's what everything was. Like, I'm done writing that altogether. But uh, that's tough. That's yeah, weird. Yeah, I can imagine that would be really, really aggravating to to get set up on something. And there's uh, there's been quite a bit of that. You know, it's 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 a rough deal. You know, you get on a book or get. Mm -hmm get two people lined up and then, you know, yeah. And like, you know, uh, when it, I'm goes dark, exactly. It's a whole weird thing. Uh, especially when I can't get, you know, reach out, let, let us, let us pay you. Let us, let us give you work. <laughs> it's something, but yeah, it's, it, it can be interesting. But the nice thing about that though, being in comics as opposed to like traditional publishing, where like, you know, if it was an original book and that was stuck in editorial hell, I'd probably be still emailing back to people on that, trying to get it through different like layers on this. But since it's a comic, uh, my part was already completely done, and I'm able to work on other projects now. And so even if that's sitting in a, a weird limbo state, I'm still able to crank out other forms of writing. <clears throat> well, that's what I do in the interim spaces is uh, sometimes I have to stop, you know, a less paying or no paying you know, job to stop and do something that's paying or something that's, you know, moving something, you know, exactly. yeah. that's why I was talking about, you know, the prioritization, you have to prioritize, constantly prioritize, you know, what is, what needs to be done now, what, you know, 
sometimes that's a little confusing because it takes you a little bit longer to get into stuff uh, and when you're moving around too much, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I try not to fill myself up too much, but it seems to happen anyway. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, so we're in the uh, back half of the hour now. Um, talk about no gun from traditional pros. I did allude to while you were uh, making your coffee run that well at some point we'll also get your 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 uh, your take on on writing comics as opposed to you know writing or creating for board games since you have also done that as well and that is you know uh, kind of an interesting experience that maybe not many people know that they that's something they can pursue is also you know write content for board games but uh, you know why would someone maybe choose comics over that or why would they choose that over comics uh, what what was kind of some of your the pros and cons there or, or benefits you say for either one? Well, I know I can only, I can only speak to what I've experienced thus far. So mm -hmm. I have written a comic before and done a comic of my own. And it was, uh, it was so fun. It was really fun. Uh, but at the same time, it was very tiring because I was doing both, both jobs. Yeah. Um, but it, it was really fun and it was uh because it's like my mind could go in that vacation of you know world building so yeah. fast and and uh you know i always had something to do something to think about you know and of course especially if something was bothering me if i had a bad day at work or if something you know was going on you know, I had that to lean on and that's, you know, that's, it was so awesome because I was in the project and I was, uh, you know, and sometimes I would make my own edits, you know, like I would be right. doing something and I would realize, Hey, this is, this is getting dry, you know? Uh, so I would change something. So, uh, a lot of times, see, I don't, so me doing my own stuff is nothing like you doing your stuff because you're doing your stuff to be able to show someone else and explain yeah. it to them. You're talking to an outsider. Me, I write my stuff down and then I start doing little page thumbnails, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I don't have to be as meticulous about the grammar and because nobody else is going to be seeing it, obviously, right. except for me. You know, and I already know what I, I already have a, you know, inside line with the artist. So, you know, yeah. uh, now with the board game, I am going to add particular uh, story to it. But up to this point, the board game has been kind of like uh, Tolkien's Cimmerillion. You know, mm -hmm. it's been laying out the world. What are the rules of the world? Where are these people from? What is this race? What it was? What is it all about? You know, so it's really laying the foundations for everything. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yep. And uh, you know, it's kind of like that right now. I mean, when you play the game, it is really about picking these things up and working it. You know, going along in the world. But as far as the story goes, it's uh, it's got a mm, overarching story to it but no particular characters other than the ones that you make in the game, you know, and you kind of do your own, you know, story, but, sure. but I'm actually going to be adding to that. Uh, you know, I'm going to be making up characters and actually having stories happen in the world. So then that's going to be fun, but it's been like awesome to, you know, usually I have, I, I, I would say usually, I think most of the time I start out with a character and right. then the story goes from there, you know, or sometimes I'll have something that happens and the story and the characters kind of line yeah. up from there. With the board game, it's like I have built the world. It's kind of like, you know, like Tolkien, I've built the world, I've built some major events, and so now... It's kind of like coming at it, I think, from backwards. You know, you're, yeah. you're going backwards. You've created the world and everything, and now you're adding characters. And now you're adding people and stories and 
interactions, you know. So it's 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 really interesting. Uh, I, I, there, one of the things that I loved the most about doing that game, though, was not about uh, so much. You know, the writing part of it was easy. I mean, I because you know you get into this thing like I'm sure you do, where you start pondering this place. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what do, what do people look like? How do they live? What do they live in? How did, you know, what kind of work do they do? You know, what kind of, uh, you know, what does their garments look like and all that kind of stuff? Um, what are their interactions? Who do they hate? Who do they like? Um, but with the doing the game, one of the things that was just one of the most rewarding and fun things was had nothing to do with any of that it was the mechanics working on the mechanics and making them work and then testing them and you know because it was something that's totally got nothing to do with writing or art or anything it's more about the technical stuff you know making it how you know trying to decide if it was fun and it was something that i learned that i really really enjoyed as much as writing and as much as drawing was coming up with these uh, rules and coming up with, you know, ways to balance things. You know, that yeah. was that was, that was just fun. Because, um, you know, in the end, all this stuff that we're doing and all this stuff you see behind me is, is, is it's escapism and it's, you know, fun and it's, uh, you know, and that was just another thing that I found that I really enjoyed that I didn't think I would really enjoy, but, it, but I did. Nice. So. Definitely. Uh, but what I will say this, I could give any writer right now the rules of the game and kind of the backstory of the world. And they could all day long come up with, their own characters and throw them in there. I mean, cause it's all, it's, it's kind of like having a Marvel universe mm. and people just coming along and throwing heroes in it, you know? Right. So it, that's only, uh, also like, uh, perhaps a, a cool advantage to working with, you know, broader concept versus, you know, if you're writing a comic, typically you, you just have your own story in mind, unless you're, you're pondering already your greater, like, universe but actually getting that done is difficult and unless you're you know you're someone that gets hired by you know marvel or dc they're like all right we need you to like brainstorm the calendar for the next year like create all the major events <laughs> uh but uh working with uh you know in games in particular but also um you know if you were to work with um hey um uh, something in that aspect is that you're allowed to to more so uh create a world that just gives you a ton of breathing room to think of all the little tiny details inside of it but you're you're able to focus on the the broader prospect first so you have a lot of room to work within whereas in comics you know you're thinking like okay i got one to five issues that i need to complete this plot line in and then go to the next one so you're not you might you're you're filling out a world but chunk by chunk whereas mm-hmm. you know working with a game or something, you're able to create the world first and then populate it. So yeah, it's, it's really, really weird, but at the same time, it's like, uh, man, I've got this whole world. I want to throw mm-hmm. stuff in it and play with it, you know? Uh, and you can do anything, uh, that is inside the world you have. It, it's kind of, it's kind of fun just because, you know, you, you know what the rules are instead yeah. of having to make them up as you go along, you know, mm-hmm. and Definitely. you can, you can all you can use the stuff that you already have to to you know uh like you know in the game um you know there's just certain items in there and that's one thing that i plan on doing is making sure that in the books that come out of it that some of these items will show up and some of these items are generic but some of them are particular items that that you know were previously owned by somebody else and thus they have their name on them and uh and so you know i want to do some stories off of that you know i mean it's just one of those things where uh you know you watch a movie and there's little easter eggs in there and you Mm -hmm. like you see something and you wonder hmm what could that be about you know and it you know that's like some of the stuff some of the items that are in the game you know you 
Kind of like Dark Souls. You remember exactly. how Dark Souls was? It was oh, that's all the history to the items, yeah. So good. You'd pick up uh, a certain item that that was named after somebody else, uh, mm. like Arturius's sword or armor or whatever. I can't remember. Uh, and you're like, who is that? You know, and then yeah. uh, throughout the story, picking up more items, you find a little more out about them here and there, but you never really get a complete picture. There's always that mystery there to them. Yeah. That's kind of the way the game is. Uh, That's also what I love about, uh, you know, the, the writing and destiny is that a lot of the storytelling is the lore attached to exotics or pinnacle weapons. And I think that's still on my bucket list is if Bungie like ever like asked me to write the lore for, you know, an item job or something. So you can get a little bit of like details about a guardian or a warlord from the past. Mm -hmm. Well, my initial plan was, was to do the base game and uh, have lots of stuff in it. And then with uh, every new expansion of it, which would be adding items and uh, events to it. It would have like story themes, you know, uh, yeah. like uh, one of the ones that's not currently in the game or not currently in the game that you would purchase it. Uh, but I have it because I, I've been play testing them uh, or I was before I started these comics yeah. <laughs> and uh, was curses. Okay. And it, they add so much to the game because uh, they're really awesome items, but at the same time, um, they're very, you know, they can really turn around on you. Like mm -hmm. a lot of times what one of the parts of the game is, is, is people are always wanting to be the one to draw the item card. Like you defeat an, you have an event. You defeat an enemy, and sometimes they have an item, and you don't know what that item's going to be because there's a stack of items, and you have to draw a card off the top yeah. of the item stack. You don't know what that could be, but a lot of times you're excited. You know, like, yeah, what yeah. could it be? It could be this. It could be this horn that takes control of an NPC, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and makes it your follower. It could be, you know, this other thing that, you know, makes you stronger or better. It could be a healing potion, which is very rare in the game. It could be, a, you know, anything. You know, people are excited. But with curses, it's like you draw something and then all of a sudden, like, for the next, uh, it, it's like uh, this curse that not only affects you for, like, two battles, but then it falls off and goes to the next player beside oh, yeah. you to the right and goes around the table you know, leaving from one person to the next. Yeah. And it, it's, it's aggravating, but it's funny at the same time because it, the people you're playing with, they're like, you know, uh, laughing at each other, you know, because now they have the curse and it's kind of like yeah. a venereal disease passing it around. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah. I think also if you're writing for games, you get that additional benefit, kind of like where comics uh, benefit from, from having that, you know, being that visual medium as opposed to prose. Mm -hmm. Games have additional benefit of being something that you're already actively engaged with. So then good, yeah. good, good flavor text or good story text in addition to that can really just, if, if you can capitalize on the emotional engagement that's already there, it can really elevate the experience. Um, so similar to the, the, the drawing, the perfect card kind of idea, uh, we're playing a game of um, Commander. And uh, we're in the, the mid stage where everyone is, is board wiping and we're all sort of politicking, trying to like... I know. Oh, I know. Yeah. I um, love Commander. It's yes. like my favorite. Uh, and I, I'm playing um, uh, uh, essentially it's a mecha deck from um, the new Kamigawa set. Uh, one of the cards in there uh, that I have uh, allows me to turn a creature instead into a vehicle with a crew and a, a value skill. Uh, a crew and a power uh, status all the, uh, of a vehicle so it no longer becomes a creature instead it's a vehicle that you have to crew uh, in the middle of politicking uh, uh, someone plays a board wipe um, the card that I have is an instant and I just draw it so I turn to the guy who I'm trying to you know politic with and I say like I can save your your I can save the thing you have in your board state it's going to look a little weird but I can do that if you help me out on your turn he says yeah. alright so I play that and he's, he's playing a, a bear tribal deck so he has this one really big bear on the board. So I turn his bear into a vehicle. The flavor text on the card 
uh, says, well, on the bright side, the bear now has cup holders. <laughs> <laughs> so just the, the combination of, of the, the, the oddity of me p- turning my friend's bear into uh, <laughs> essentially a robot. And then the card also magnifying that saying, well, now the bear has cup holders. It, we, everyone at the table just died cackling for about three minutes because every, everything like the writing on the cards just elevated the experience so much. Well, that that is one of the things that I absolutely love about gaming is you get in there and and you're interacting, mm-hmm. you know, with each other and going through this thing. I mean, whenever you you role playing, you're going through a story. You know, that was one of the reasons why I even started doing the game to start with is because, you know, I was uh, before I was doing comics and I wanted to do comics and all that. But, I, you know, I, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, you, uh, you you do a comic, people will read it and then it's on to the next, you know, mm-hmm. and um, which, you know, I don't mean to be, belittle it, you know, because yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's sometimes, you know, you can really touch somebody, you know, I've had comics mm-hmm. that really affected me, you know, gave me a different perspective, yeah. uh, w- uh, you know, as with any other book, you know, that I, I've read, you know, there's always some little tidbit in there that I can take away from it or a story that I remember that I really liked. But, you know, the thing that really drew me in about the gaming was, is, uh, because my in my own personal life, whenever I've gamed, I really have such a good time interacting with people and interacting with the story. And a lot of times, you know, you you go back through some of your memories with people and you're talking about stuff that happened, you know, and if there was somebody outside of your group listening to you, hey, you remember the time we went up in this castle and we, you know, this, you know, ghoul came after us and blah, blah, blah. You know, anybody else would think we're nuts, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, it, and, you know, the interaction with games is just so awesome. And uh, what better way to write a story and and people not just read it and move on, but they actually, you know, interact with it and interact with each other in it, with yeah. it. And that's one of the things I love about role playing is, uh, you know, and, and all that stuff is because, uh, you know, there's a lot of people they just can't understand why people love to role play. But, you know, it's not a, uh, it, it's about good stories and being able to actually impact the story. That's yeah. awesome. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 that's that's why I turned toward gaming. And the comic side of it or the story side of it was just going to be like tertiary to, yeah. you know, uh, to all of it. But eventually I will get back to it uh, after I get some of the silver line stuff uh, yes. finished out. I'm going to get back to it and, uh, you know, actually make it squeaky clean. Yes. Well, I love yeah. gaming stuff. That game is so good, but yeah. So maybe, maybe not to the point, the Pete, the the point of the of the subject. But if you have the option between prose and comics, you know, you want to write comics because you're gonna, because it is just a, inherently more engaging. If it even if it's not viewed as literary, it is a more engaging medium. But if you have the option, write for games because games are great. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I I did say I talked about this before um, uh, in the start of the stream. So I'll, I'll say it before we we wrap up in the next ten minutes or so. But also compared writing comics to to writing for film, which is something that I have a little bit of experience in. I wrote a few pieces of short film, uh, uh, one of which being a punk rock band version of uh, Henry V. Uh, so just imagine the story of Henry V, but then transpose that into uh, the the dealing with familial politics that are preventing him from living out his, his punk rock dreams. Um, <laughs> but, you know, writing for film or also writing for comics, you know, whereas comics, you get the benefit of, you know, working with the team in collaboration. Yeah. Uh, I feel like film, even if it's not so much, um, even if it's not a big studio production, uh, film can suffer from having too many chefs in the kitchen. That yeah, yeah, I, uh, I absolutely agree. That's one of the things I love about comics is it's just uh, you have so much more. I mean, what you write is actually for for the most part going to be what the comic is, mm-hmm. uh, and, the you finished know, product. 
Absolutely. And if you really love the collaborative experience of, of like going down through so many hands, then maybe film is for you. But I, yeah, for me, it gets, it, it's weird seeing my work get so diluted where uh, even working like in a small, like independent short film, it still goes from me to a director, to a uh, director of cinematography, and then to a actor. So already there, you're changing so many hands, and uh, the presentation and uh, you know representation of uh, what's happening because of so many changes. So if you're not, if there's something you're not precious about, if you're not precious about uh, that with your writing, or if you love, if if you're a person who loves seeing that change happen over time, like mm. I like it, uh, I like it to an extent. Like uh, I'm okay with writing for for stage. We did a little bit of stage writing leading into that because you know Shakespeare, obviously. So we did it first as a play, and then and went into uh, like a uh, part of like a fifteen play, a fifteen minute play festival, and then eventually got turned into a short film. Uh, so writing for stage is one thing because it, it it changes hands like once or twice, similar to comics where you know the penciler is going to interpret it, and then the inker might add a little bit more to that. Whereas you know writing for stage, the director is going to change it, and then the actor may add a little bit more on top of that. But the film it changes so many times, not including edits and all that uh, afterwards. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, and, and it could be somebody coming in and saying, hey, this is crap. We don't like this. You know, mm -hmm. the investors, the people putting up the money, we don't like this. Yeah, you need to redo this. And mm -hmm. then they have all these reshoots and stuff. And, uh, you know, before long, you know, it, it's just not the, the spirit of what you had even done in the first place is not even there. You know, in comics, you, you, you have the ability to be collaborative with people. But at the same time, the spirit of your work is still there. The thing that made you work on it, made you want to do it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to some extent, whenever you do any sort of collaboration, you have to kind of divorce yourself a little bit from it. Mm -hmm. But, man, it's like uh, I hear all these, you know, script writers and stuff talk about, you know, their dealings with, film and it's like you know you have to pretty much entirely divorce mm -hmm. yourself from it because if you don't you'll go nuts and, yeah. or you won't get anything done because exactly. you won't because they're gonna change whatever it is. I mean if you and if you don't believe that just you know look at any book that was changed to a movie mm -hmm. uh, or not changed to a movie but uh, you know um a movie done of any book or graphic novel or any of that stuff. It's always different. I mean, yeah. they, um, you know, it's like Del Toro. I love uh, Del Toro's uh, work, you know, and what, what he did with Hellboy, but he said it himself, you know, he doesn't want to do a carbon copy of anything. Mm -hmm. He's going to change stuff. Yeah. And granted, I like what he did with Hellboy, but at the same time, you know, and it's a good thing that uh, Mr. Manolia, or how do you how do you say his name? The creator of Hellboy, Mike Manola. Uh, it's Magnola. I think. Yeah, I think it's Manola. Manola. Yeah. yeah. It's a good thing that he wasn't a stickler and said yeah. no. You know, we would have never got Hellboy if he would have been the kind that you know. But I guess he figured well. I, you know, he on the one hand he was probably able to just because he was already doing his own comic mm -hmm. you know and he was able to have the world he wanted you know and i guess i guess that's probably how he dealt with it being different for the yeah. movie but you know the movie wasn't really that different yeah. but i'm just saying i'm using that as an example yeah and then it also comes on like how you are as a writer like are you super like protective of what you're uh trying to say or do you view your story as something that should be interpreted multiple times? Like you compare that, like Alan Moore, like you, I think he said that he hates every adaptation of his work because he like I created it with a point. I got... Anything else than that is just me trying to cover my retirement. <laughs> Whereas yeah. Neil Gaiman, on the other hand, uh, it pretty much just said that the Netflix adaptation of Sandman is how you should engage with the media now. Because he views his work as just something that should always be interpreted. He's not protective at all. He says, whatever people interpret it as, that's the story now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, you know, uh, Frank Miller, you know, he wouldn't do, he wouldn't let his, you know, any adaptations of his stuff for so long. Um, yeah. And then he, then if he did, he had to have a certain level of control over that. 
And, uh, you know, he did good all the way up to, what was it, uh, Spirit? Or what was, uh, what was the thing that he d- yeah. did? It kind of flopped. Uh, he had a I little know. bit too much control over it. Uh, I'm not sure, but I know I know Wanted also did not do well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know, well, it's it, you know, and it's kind of on the same vein of, you know, when I'm drawing, uh, a lot of times the initial drawing is awesome and it has a lot of energy in it, but mm-hmm. it's in the pe- really rough pencil stage. Like you couldn't possibly use that and give that over to an inker and say, "Here, ink this." You right. know, <laughs> Decide I mean, these lines, but. It's like I do it and I feel it and it's got the energy that I'm looking for. It's got the spirit that I was going for, you know, and everything. And it seems like sometimes the more lines you add and the more cleanup that you do on it, the more it loses the soul of what it started out as. Yes. And although it still is passable, it's kind of aggravating at the same time because it lost something in translation and that happens a lot and uh so i kind of liken the story stuff to that too you know you you come up with this wonderful idea you have something that's in your heart in your soul and you're putting it out there and it's like the you know you kind of with comics you know you have a few people you collaborate with and there's some minor changes and stuff but for the most part, that kind of gets out there, but mm-hmm. you know, other people get a hold of it and they edit the mess out of it. And before long, it's not the it's not the story that yeah. you started with. You know, it's not saying what you wanted it to say, or maybe it's just not. It doesn't have the tone that mm-hmm. you had. You know, to to begin with. That's sometimes nice. that's a happy thing. You know, it's good. You know, it's be- yeah. it comes out better, but sometimes it's not. You know. Right. I think also uh, one last point before we begin to wrap up here for the night, because uh, again, this is a shorter episode because uh, we got things in the morning and uh, yep. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so our hosts are currently missing without power. So we'll save some yes. energy for them next week. Um, but uh, another thing that uh, Roland brings up with comics in class and what I love about it is you, you have um, your, um, your special effects budget is as much as your artist is willing to draw. Uh, That's right. That's uh, one thing I love about drawing comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're, you're working in a film or anything like that, you know, you're going to have, uh, you know, your producer's going to say, we've allotted this much for practical, this much for CGI. You're allowed to, to go this far before we have to cut you off. Whereas in comics, uh, you you write a panel, like, I'm going to have these many ships in space. They're going to shoot the, they're shooting each other in a broadside. So many of them blow up. And then you contact your artist, like, this is, is this too much? And they'll tell you yes or no. But uh yeah if it's really cool usually your artist is gonna say heck yeah i want to draw that <laughs> uh and you can go full board with your visuals with it yeah i think it's uh you know the talented people in hollywood i think you know i don't think they get enough credit in some ways because a lot of times they're asked to do stuff oh yeah and, you know, it's in the script, it's stuff that they want done, but at the same time, they've got to figure out with what they have in front of them, how are we going to do this? Mm-hmm. I think it's so amazing whenever I see these, uh, these you know, shows of how movies are put together and everything, you know, you know like documentaries. You know, they're, a lot of times they're just wondering, you know, how are we going to do this with the budget we have? Yes. And, uh, you know, it, it's one you, you think, you know, the tendency is to think that, well, they got all these millions of dollars. They can just go buy whatever. Yeah. But a lot of times, you know, and especially uh, back in the 80s and the 90s when they're doing stuff that's never been done before and there's very little CGI, you know, yeah. you know, to see that to see how they work this stuff out was absolutely amazing. I remember watching the, the SG one or, or the Stargate movie. Uh, you know, how they did the, you know, in, in the, with the gate with, you know, the, the effects with the thing coming out, yes. the, uh, you know, the, the, the plume, the water plume or whatever. And they actually uh, used, you know, that tube, a clear tube, and they had water in there and they poured, or, or I think they poured water in it or they shot air into it and they filmed it from below 
so that you'd see that plume come down and that's what you see in the show yeah. uh i think that's that's awesome that's amazing mm-hmm how they did that stuff. I mean, that is creativity trying to figure out how to do stuff with a shoestring budget, you know, Mm -hmm. and it be passable and look good and do good. Uh, But see with comics, we can do whatever we want. I mean, it's gotta be still, there's no motion, but you know, right. Like with uh, that, you know, if you're like described, uh, when you're, you're describing the visual effect you want to your director of cinematography and your director, like, they're gonna start thinking about like how many props you gotta get, how do you have to film this, what do you gotta do? If you describe something similar like that to your artist, like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. You're gonna sketch something out and like, yep, like zip, this. Zip, zip. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So you mean is... like this? And you hold it up. Yeah. Yeah, like just like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that is uh definitely definitely a, a very especially if you're working in genre heavy stuff with a lot of fantasy or a lot of science fiction, uh that comics are, are fantastic for that because you can get away with a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you don't have, uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, the insurance, you know, well, we can't do this. We can't do that. And, you know, because of insurance or because the, yeah. you know, this group over here won't like it or that group over there won't like, you know, cause there's so many people involved in these films mm-hmm. and stuff. And, you know, you can't watch a film nowadays without certain things being in it, you know, and a certain amount of those things have to be in it, too, because there's so many people involved in the stuff. It's but ridiculous. My favorite thing is, have you ever heard about the Transformers beer quota? No, I haven't. I can't remember if it's Curse Light or something, but uh, a beer company has sponsored all the Transformers movies. So they had to show so so many of those beer cans. Yes, product movie. placement. Yeah. So they got yeah. tired. They got tired of that. But I think it was the uh, was Armageddon the fourth movie, or something like that. So they had a scene where I don't know. I lost track. Sure. So they have a scene where there is a a, a truck gets blown over, and it's that that beer company. And if you look at all the cans, just one on the back, they're all faced to camera. Of course. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe an idea there, Tim. Uh, whenever you you should you go out and look for sponsors. Hey, we'll do some product placement in yes. our book if you you know. Of well, course, I don't I don't know how Coors would work out in Wolf Hunter. You know, Wolf Hunter back in the forties. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, with our with our vampire with our uh, 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 Georgian uh, Winnie the Pooh vampire story, I will absolutely include. Uh, uh, I'll I'll make a 1920s Del Taco in England. Uh, yes, to watch that. there you go. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. It may be an idea, a way to get you know the book sponsored. It, you know, go out and get some sponsors. Hey, if you know if you give so much money to this, then we'll we'll throw your logo in here and, mm-hmm. and some panels, and you get a contributor copy. You know, absolutely yes, It'd be fantastic. And you can check it out. That's a good idea. Yes. That's a good idea. All right. Well, it's probably has, already being done by somebody. I'm sure uh, it is. Oh, uh, probably, but you know, we'll 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 uh, we'll, th- we'll we'll joy in the notion that it was our idea that yes. we came up with it on this show. We're original. Exactly. We'll we'll do the Disney thing, and we'll compound and and perfect it uh, like they did yeah. with all the originals movies. <laughs> and even though we're doing something, uh, you know, that has been done before, we'll say that we came up with it. And, yes. you know, it's like the newest, freshest thing that's ever, you know, and yes. we did it. Exactly. Yeah. That's all we'll do. All right. Well, this has been uh, That's Over Line Show on Tuesday. Uh, we have talked about you know, why you should write comics or in this case, uh, why you should write games as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday um, talking. About... Maybe we'll have some more of the crew and maybe we'll be doing hopefully. some drawing. Yeah, so. hopefully, hopefully we have some uh, some internet issues figured out. Uh, well, thank you for uh, thank you, Mr. Mark. The show, Mark. Thank yeah. you for joining us, Hyper Potato. And uh, I can't really see ah. who the other comments are from, but our, uh, but uh, we really appreciate y'all coming in yeah. and spending a little bit of time with us while we chew the fat. Okay, ne- next week is going to be more so on you or uh, Jose and Aaron if they can make it. Uh, how to draw comic covers. The- Oh yeah, that that sh- that yeah. should be good. The difference is between cover and panel art. So, uh, talking about you know specifically covers. So that'll be a good one. Uh, also, be sure to check out this channel at 8 p.m. Eastern Wednesdays and Sundays for Wednesday OM and Silver Sunday. Um, 
A reminder that the 25th is going to be a completely different style of episode. We'll be doing a live play episode of Vampire the Masquerade. So, yes. Yes, I need people in the in the group chat on the show to get back to me on rolling characters and, and you know briefly going over some of the rules. Uh, I'll get a Roll20 room set up for that so we can share that screen and people can just click on the button to roll their dice. <laughs> That's going to be cool. Yeah. That's going to be awesome. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I said, we'll be back next week. And until the time, make mine. Make mine line. silver line. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Hey, Owen, don't forget. Hey, don't... I'm Pat Broderick. Make mine silver line.